All right, um, so welcome and uh, to this, uh, today's version of Lunch and Learn. Um, this is gonna be a large gathering of some of my best friends here, I can see. Um, and so we are going to uh, talk about, um, you may hear this often, but it's actually never literally true, but this today it is, a once in a lifetime event. Um, if you missed it in 2004, um, unless you plan to live to be about 150 years old, you're probably not gonna see this thing again. Or, um, and so um, we're gonna talk about the uh, Venus in transit, and um, we're gonna do a little bit more than just talk about the, the transit of Venus across the uh, solar disk that we can observe in person tomorrow um, afternoon. Uh, we're also gonna talk about the significance of this, uh, of this astronomical um, event in terms of uh, its impact on space science. And, and, and there's a very rich history here, uh, which uh, I hope you'll enjoy, um, and, it's, and it's made a big, a significant difference. Uh, as you came in, you will have noticed that there's some posters and also some of these uh, viewing glasses. Uh, so please, uh, welcome to take one. Uh, take only one, don't take 20 for all your family and friends tomorrow, because a lot of people are, we're gonna spread these out. Um, uh, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about these glasses here in a little bit, uh, but it's very important that you get some if you want to view the event. So let's go ahead and start about um, and talk about the, uh, the Venus in transit. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, this uh, talk that I got, that I'm going to present here, is largely put together by uh, Dr. Jim Green, um, who's the uh, Planetary Science Division Director up at NASA headquarters. And uh, he sat with uh, Corky and I actually on Thursday afternoon and says, Jim, I got this great uh, thing I'm gonna be presenting to the employees of the Discovery Channel. And as Corky and I were looking at it, we're going, man, this is great. I wonder if we could steal it from you and uh, share it at Marshall. He said, great, sure. So I've adjusted it just slightly, but uh, so in large part, this is put together by Jim Green and with significant contributions also from JPL, as you'll see. Um, so first of all, let's talk about what a transit is. And uh, it's, it's very simple. It's basically uh, uh, when, it's like an eclipse um, where an object passes between us and the sun and it blocks out part of the light. Now when a lunar eclipse occurs, uh, or a solar eclipse, when the moon goes between the uh, sun and the earth, it really blocks out essentially the entire sun. Well, Venus is, um, is uh, too close to the sun to actually do all that, but it will go across the sun and um, you will be able to see its uh, shadow as it uh, curses uh, or if it, as it passes across the disk of the sun. And so that's essentially what a transit is. We don't see this um, every time Venus gets near the sun because the orbit of Venus and the orbit of Earth around the sun are slightly tilted towards each other. So there are times when Venus goes between us and the sun, but because of the angle, um, it does not pass in front of the sun, and we don't see a transit. Uh, but occasionally this does happen, and it only happens um, every so often. Um, and here are the dates that you can see that uh, previous transits, and of course tomorrow is the one that's gonna happen um, here. And you'll see also this, um, that uh, it doesn't happen um, uh, on a periodic basis. And, and, what, and the reason that is is because um, uh, on two consecutive opportunities where Venus is between us and the sun. And sometimes it's skimming the top of the sun and sometimes it's skimming the bottom of the sun. This kind of illustrates that point. Um, uh, if you look at the, the path of Venus in the sky in 2004, um, the, the, the last time the, the transit occurred, you can see that, it, that it, at first it started transiting, this is the sun, first it started transiting above the sun and then, and then its pathway um, if you were to extend it here, you could see it went right across the sun, but then the next time it came by, it was below the sun. So because of the angle, it, we don't get this transit every time, um, observed every time, uh, but tomorrow is the first one, or it'll be the last one for another hundred and so, some odd years. Now, uh, this is obviously not a new event. Uh, there are, there's evidence that um, uh, of, these, of Venus transits uh, in history, uh, back to the Babylonian days in 1500 BC, um, and even in the, in the Aztecs, uh, Montezuma in some of their recordings, um, there's evidence of that. Um, I know this is true because I got this on the web, and so therefore it must be obviously true, but uh, 
No, seriously, there, you know, there, it's not conclusive evidence, but uh, uh, people who really understand this uh, do believe that um, they were um, referencing, or it's a strong possibility that they were referencing a Venus transit. Our very first, um, and so let's talk a little bit about the impact of this Venus transit to uh, space science. Um, I'm going to make the case that um, in NASA, as, as NASA in terms of they talk about the science mission directorate, that um, we have um, uh, astrophysics, we have planetary science, we have earth science, and we have heliophysics. And I'm going to try to make the case today that uh, in every one of these areas, this particular uh, event uh, throughout time has, has played a role in each of those uh, science dif disciplines. Beginning in uh, 1610 with Galileo, um, and, his, uh, and, and the uh, um, development of the telescope, he was able to measure the phases of Venus, much like we see the, the lunar phases, and determined that that, that that bright object in the sky was not just a point, but it was actually a disk or a ball. And he could observe the phases of Venus. And this uh, was very significant uh, at that period of time because it further confirmed the uh, Cap Capricornian or Copernicus uh, idea that um, that the sun that, that the planets resolved, revolved around the sun and not everything around the earth, and so y'all know a little bit about the uh, trials and tribulations that Galileo and Galilei went through on that, uh, but nevertheless, um, it, um, the um, the observations of Venus were very significant um, in that sense. Several years later, Kepler, who um, working with his mentor, um, looked at a, a ton of data of these. Uh, planets as they as they were being discovered and trying to understand what their motion was and of course Kepler came up with the uh, uh, theory of orbital mechanics and um, and and in doing so um, he predicted a, uh, a Venus transit in uh, 1631 now unfortunately um, this particular transit was not visible in Europe so there's no recorded evidence about anybody having seen it and of course you know, there may have been a little bit of disappointment from the, from the folks at that point. However, eight years later, you know, this is kind of that, that second pair of the transit, it was observed. Uh, Jeremiah Herrick correctly predicts uh, and then first observes the Venus transit and his, and his buddy William Crabtree, Crabtree did the same. And so this is our first time where we uh, get really strong evidence uh, or first um, uh, unmistakable uh, observations of the, of the transit across the sun. And so in planetary science, we're beginning to see that um, the folks are getting a handle about you know, how the planets move and where they are. And, and um, so it, had a, it, was, it played a pretty major role in planetary science. Now the following year, you can see that, uh, let's see, how do I go back? Anyway, uh, the following opportunity for the transits now in 1761, um, now that people were able to predict it, um, it was observed by um, several people, 176, but we made a new discovery. Um, um, Mikhail Lomonosov um, observed that as, as, the, um, as the planet was approaching the edge of the, of the um, solar disk and as it was exiting, that the light appeared to be bent around the, uh, the, the planet in this fashion. Now you can kind of see it observed right here. See that little uh, light area right there? And so uh, when that was first observed, people were thinking, what's going on here? Well, it turns out that now um, this is basically the discovery of the atmosphere of Venus. And much like our atmosphere here on Earth bends light's rays as it comes through, um, this is what we are recording here, that the atmosphere of Venus is now bending the light rays as it comes around and it kind of serves as a lensing effect. And so now we have um, the discovery that uh, another planet has some sort of Earth-like properties. Now, we now know that the atmosphere of Venus is very, very different, but nevertheless, the discovery of the fact that uh, one of the planets had an atmosphere was very significant in, in many ways. Um, but certainly, you know, oh, so that's my connection to Earth science, and that's about as close as I'm going to get. Sorry, Jim. Um, but um, anyway, so that, I, I'm going to go with that. And so, um, uh, so in 1761, that discovery was made. Um, now the next time the, the transit occurred, eight years later, um, there were, um, uh, people had begun to, uh, uh, the scientific community had begun to rally around this event. It was predicted. Um, there were over 400 sightings. Uh, probably the most uh, interesting one was Captain Cook. 
as he was over in the Tahiti Islands, set up an observation point and observed it from Tahiti. Uh, basically, people were observing this all over the Earth. So now you're beginning to get a sense of, of, of you know, what the extent this is um, and, and maybe even use that information to help us calculate the distance between the Earth and the Sun. Uh, in, um, in Pennsylvania, you can see this kind of gives you a sense of the, of the uh, type of data that they were collecting at that point. And, uh, and so uh, this uh, guy, Norrington, you know, from Pennsylvania, made very, very detailed uh, um, um, calculations of where it was and at what time. I can't read all that, so I'm not sure exactly all it says, but um, obviously there's a lot of information there. The next opportunity for the transit now uh, now the federal government gets involved, so now we know we're in really big, good business. And uh, um, at that time, the technology of the uh, photograph, the photographic technology was being developed. So now the observations are made um, in the sense that uh, they're gonna, they can be very uh, carefully made and more exacting. And in fact, uh, in 1874, for the first time, Congress allocates $75,000 for uh, space science um, research. So that's kind of a, um, um, a preview of things to come. But back in 1874 is the first time that that occurred. And with all of those observations, uh, they first beginning, began to publish the, the uh, calculated distance between the Earth and the Sun. And um, um, in 1874, they, pre they uh, calculated to be 91 million miles. And this was done with uh, triangulation and uh, the observations at the um, very extremes of the Earth on one side or the other and uh, when the uh, transit occurred. Here's some evidence, here's some photographic uh, observations that were made uh, by the Lick Observatory in, Can in California where they uh, pieced together many uh, uh, photographic plates and um, by uh, a student, or by taken by uh, Vassar College um, and her, uh, Maria, Maria Mitchell and her students in 1882. So you can see that uh, at this point, um, even students are get, becoming to get involved uh, with trying to understand um, uh, and, and learn about this event. Uh, with all of these um, uh, calculations, um, the, uh, the astronomical unit, that is the distance between the Earth and the Sun, is kind of a fundamental unit uh, used in planetary and within heliophysics. Um, uh, is beginning to, to begin is beginning to be narrowed down, and in 1882, uh, the best calculation put it at about 92,720,000 miles. Um, we now know that, uh, based on the, some of the radar studies and um, uh, of some of the missions, uh, that we have it at 92,957,209 miles. And so, back in 1882, they got it within 0.3 percent of what we know is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. And that's really quite remarkable, considering the technology that they had at, at their disposal at that time. So here we see um, a lot of good heliophysics coming in, where they are, they are um, really nailing down the distance between the Earth and the Sun. By this time, now it has caught the public's imagination. And so uh, for the transit in 1882, about every national newspaper uh, and international newspaper headlined the event, um, uh, you know, political cartoons, I'm sure, were rampant at that time. Uh, but the, also the famous John Philip Sousa, the march band uh, composer, composed a march um, called Venus. And if you go out on the web and click it, um, as you're watching the transit tomorrow afternoon, you'll even be more inspired to enjoy the event. Uh, not only that, but uh, science fiction now uh, has caught hold. And uh, Edgar Rice Burrow of Tarzan fame but also of um, uh, John Carter fame, most recently in a movie, um, also wrote about Venus. Now, this was uh, Carson Napier is the hero here, uh, so stay tuned for Hollywood on that. But nevertheless, it did catch the people's imagination, and folks were uh, very interested in what, uh, um, in, in what was happening there. Now, at the event of the Space Age, um, of course, this is going to be one of the places that we want to go visit. And in fact, uh, Mariner 2, a 1962 mesh mission from NASA, was NASA's first, first uh, foyer out beyond the Earth-Moon system, basically the first NASA probe that left 
um, our Earth environment to go explore elsewhere, uh, went to Venus on the Mariner 2 mission. Uh, the Russians were heavily engaged, oops, the Russians were heavily engaged in, uh, in this activity also, if I can get it back, um, with, um, uh, with several landers that they sent uh, in 1881, and then in 1884 they even launched some balloons. So now we actually have in situ observations of this uh, very um, densely atm uh, coated atmospheric planet. Um, and we, you know, understanding what, what lay below that uh, dense uh, fog of essentially we know now as sulfuric acid, um, uh, uh, what lay beneath it was, a, was a, a very great interest. Magellan, with its radar, um, um, was able to uh, map the surface of Venus. Um, and more recently, uh, the Venus Express, Express and ESA mission uh, with NASA collaboration um, has uh, helped us learn a little bit more about the, uh, the history of that topography and the history of the surface of uh, Venus. So um, when we first optically observed Venus, this is basically what it looked like. It was, uh, you know, had a, a thick atmosphere over it and uh, I'm trying to figure out how to But with the radars, now we can see down below, and we see a very uh, heavily structured um, surface where, um, uh, where the green and the blues identify the higher, uh, the lower elevations, and the uh, light colored redder are the uh, uh, higher elevations of uh, Venus. Noticing here, this is a very prominent, uh, a large uh, mountain. It turns out to be a volcano. Is it? So um, uh, this right here gives a sense, uh, this is a movie put together by JPL and gives you a sense of, of uh, what the uh, planet looked like uh, in uh, uh, its surface as we first observed uh, Venus optically. Um, but now if we can see through that uh, with the radar, uh, we see a highly structured um, uh, planet that um, has uh, um, a rich history in terms of uh, cratering, as well as uh, activity that's uh, in there. Another movie here um, put together kind of gives you a sense of, of what, um, of, of, of how the international collaboration has really served us well. Um, this is a 3D rendering done by um, JPL um, of of one of the uh, um, active or large mountains on the surface, and it turns out to be uh, an active region because as ESA went and measured the temperature of the surface, um, you could, with this cover, color overlay, you could see that the fresher, the red and the yellow are the uh, more recent um, and hotter temperature um, uh, regions, indicating perhaps a recent uh, a lava flow off the mountain, off the volcano. And basically that's indicating that uh, Venus is a very active, um, is, is perhaps more active than what, what we thought. There are a lot of things that we've learned about um, Venus. Um, uh, one of the things is that uh, it's very hot there. Here's a, here's a plot of temperature as a function of altitude. So on the surface we're talking about close to 800 degrees Fahrenheit, very, very hot. Um, kind of a nasty environment here. Here's sulfuric acid. There's a strong layer of sulfuric acid about uh, between 40 and 50 kilometers. Um, and, uh, and then the pressure is also very, it's very dense there uh, with the pressures getting about 90 times greater than the pressure here on the surface of the earth. So think of yourself in a pressure cooker. Um, that's what you'd be like if you were sitting on Venus. So it's a very nasty environment from, from a human's perspective. Um, the, the, the last area that I want to talk about in terms of the application is astrophysics, and I want to draw your attention to the Kepler mission, where the Kepler mission, as you may recall, is a mission which is looking for exoplanets, that is, planets beyond our solar system. And the primary way they do that is they look at various stars within our galaxy uh, and look at the brightness of that star and um, every once in a while they'll see a dip in the brightness of the star and then it'll come back above. 
And that's basically when a planet is transiting, just like Venus is going to be doing, across that star. And so basically they, ob they are observing um, planetary transits um, you know, thousands of light years away uh, in the same way that we are going to be observing the planetary, uh, the, the Venus transit eight light minutes away. But it's the same technique you, if you understand that. And so uh, Kepler has been very successful. Um, and periodically you hear about updates, but the latest count, it's over 2,000 candidate systems with almost 700 of them confirmed uh, having planetary systems. Again, they're looking at things that are 1,000 light years away. Um, whereas here, uh, what we're doing is very much, um, is very close by. It's only eight light minutes away. But yet, um, Hubble Telescope is basically going to do the same thing uh, on this Venus, on this transit uh, tomorrow. And basically what they're going to be doing is, is they're, they're going to not look directly at the sun because that would kind of burn everything up in Hubble. Um, but what they're going to do is they are going to look at, off the surface of the moon. And they've already taken a background measurement in a particular region of the moon, uh, the Tycho Crater here, taken very good observations and, and basically have gotten a, a, a background um, reflectance uh, intensity. Uh, but as Venus transits across the sun, uh, they're going to see a drop in that background uh, intensity, and then they'll see it go back up again by looking at essentially a reflectance sp sphere, um, which is basically going to be a proxy for looking at the sun. But they're going to do more than that. Uh, Hubble is a very capable uh, asset, as you know, and they can also look at the spectral characteristics of that light. That is, they can look at the color or the wavelength uh, distribution that's coming off the, the lunar surface. Now, remember, when Venus transits across the sun, it's got an atmosphere, and part of the light that comes that's going to strike the moon is going to be going through that atmosphere. And so uh, some of the sunlight that uh, um, Hubble is going to uh, observe as the Venus goes across is going to be altered slightly by the light going through Venus's atmosphere and maybe getting absorbed by some of the constituents in the Venus atmosphere. So they're going to be able also to, to again, measure in an in a indirect way uh, some of the atmospheric constituents of Venus by doing this way. And Kepler is going to end up doing the same thing uh, for you know, planetary systems you know, thousands of light years away. Basically, this kind of gives you a sense of, of how difficult the observations are that Kepler is making, um, as well as the power of really studying very carefully whenever we uh, launch these missions and, and looking at the data in every which way possible to maximize the uh, output that we get from it. OK, so now let's talk about what's going to happen tomorrow. Tomorrow afternoon, basically beginning around 5 o'clock, uh, the, the Venus is going to begin to cut across this uh, local time here in Huntsville cut across the, uh, the, so the sun's surface, uh, the so solar disk. And here's a map uh, of the world kind of indicating about where, um, who's going to be able to see it. And so if you're in this part of the world, you're going to be able to see uh, the transit basically beginning at sunrise. Um, unfortunately, if you're in this part of the world, um, you're not going to get to see it at all. But here we are in, in, in this part of the world where we're going to see it at sunset. And so, um, uh, basically, we'll, um, before we'll be able to see it beginning, like I said, at 5 o'clock local time all the way through sunset. Um, the Venus, uh, it will not have transited all the way by sunset. Um, if you're in the green part of the area, you get to see the entire um, transit. And so um, notice that Hawaii is out here in this region. And so um, uh, NASA has is, is arranged and for several feeds, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but You'll be able to see the, the, the transit the entire time um, if you want to watch it on the web after the sun sets uh, wherever you happen to be. So here's kind of, um, um, and, and the poster that you can pick up ha basically has this image um, where beginning at um, uh, 2209 UT, which is basically 510 or 509 local time here, it begins to transit and uh, continues its path all the way to 449 UT which is near um, midnight, um, our local time. Of course, the sun won't be visible, so it's not like we're going to be able to see it with our naked eye at that point. OK, now viewing tips. This is the safety moment, another safety moment. Do not look at the sun with your naked eye, OK? Um, uh, and what I mean by that is don't look at the sun with your naked eye. 
just don't do it. And that's what these little glasses are for. And so I want to do a little exercise right here. I want everybody to get their glasses and I want you to put them on. Um, and uh, now, so this is what a 3D movie looks like when the power goes out. Basically, you can't see anything, okay? And, that, and so these are not your typical sunglasses. Okay, now you can take them off. Um, basically, you can't see anything, all right? Because they're, they're incredibly dense. You're only going to see something if you're looking at something as bright as the sun. And very few things are as bright as the sun. But that also says that very few things block out the light this way as well. So don't use your normal sunglasses or don't try to squint or something like that. Use these glasses, or if you happen to be in the welding business or married to a welder, whatever, um, you can use your welding glasses so long as um, make sure, ah, I keep pushing the wrong button, uh, make sure that um, you uh, have a, a number 14 welder's glass. Now here, you know, obviously you can see, this makes it a lot easier because now you can bring your, your binoculars up to your eyes to look at it, whatever. Okay, but use these glasses. Uh, the transit's going to take a long time. You know, sunset is, you know, not for a couple hours after it begins, so you can kind of share it around. Everybody can enjoy it. But there are other ways to look at the uh, transit as well. Um, you can look at, you can use a telescope so long as you have a good solar filter on front. And basically, this uh, welding glass is, is your solar filter. Put it on the front end of the telescope, not on the back end, because the light is really concentrated there and uh, it may not work quite as well. But put it on the front end, and then you can look through your telescope um, or your binoculars. Third way is, is indirect viewing. And this is basically a couple of ways you can do it, either with a telescope where you essentially, instead of looking through the eyepiece, you project that image down onto the ground or a, or a, a piece of paper. Or you can use a pinhole camera. It's not quite as, it's very super simple, it's really easy to do, get like a paper plate or a sheet of paper or cardboard, just poke a little pinhole in it, and then uh, put, have another piece of uh, paper behind it, and um, that will serve, that will lend, that will image the sun back onto that second sheet of paper, and you can kind of move it farther apart if you want it larger. Um, it's not the ideal thing, but it's, it's, it's a very easy thing to do, and it's a very safe thing to do, and, it, and uh, you can, um, not only can you look at the transit this way, but you can look at sunspots when, there, when we get a lot of sunspots at Solar Max coming up. It's a really neat way to look at the sun. Um, I will tell you that in the parking lot of 4600 tomorrow afternoon on your way home, stop by. There are going to be telescopes out there where you can be viewing the, the, uh, the transit. And so it'll be um, a, a great opportunity. Again, once in a lifetime, so don't forget. But uh, the main thing about this chart is don't look at the sun with your naked eye. All right, there's also going to be, uh, NASA is really heavily engaged in this thing. Um, there's a lot of information out there on the web. If you go to venustransit.nasa.gov, there's a host of information available um, on this website. Some of the activities that are going to be taking place that are sponsored by NASA include a live web chat from Marshall, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Um, there'll be webcasts from up to 10 locations where, depending on where you are across the surface of the Earth, um, you'll be able to, um, they'll be able to, to follow the entire transit, uh, be broadcast live, uh, be broadcast on NASA TV. Uh, images from the space station, Don Pettit, um, who does a great job in terms of providing us um, information and images and very interesting um, activities from space station is going to be uh, participating as well as some of our solar missions. The Solar Dynamic Observatory will be observing this. A lot of activity on the social media, on your iPhone. There's an app that you can download if you go to this website. Um, uh, at any rate, just a, just a ton of stuff. Oh, and here you go. Here's the, here's the Sosa March. Um, make sure and listen to that. Um, again, venustransit.nasa.gov. Um, go there. Okay, now the web chat. This is something that Marshall has done, particularly with the Science Mission Directorate that has uh, received a very good response. In fact, at the SMD Monthly uh, last week, uh, we presented um, a whole uh, special feature on the Marshall web chats and, and the, how successful they've been. And, and, and while Marshall's kind of focused, it's not, it's not an only a Marshall thing, it's just that that's, that tends to be where um, we've kind of really taken advantage of this one particular media. And uh, our folks have done a great job on many activities, uh, many different events that have occurred. 
Uh, well, and we're going to do it again uh, tomorrow afternoon, uh, beginning at 3.30 p.m. local time. Um, it's going to begin with a, um, and basically you, you log on to this uh, web chat um, address right here, uh, nasa.gov connect slash chat slash VNet transit. Um, and at 3.30, uh, Dr. Karen Kinamuchi from Ames, she's a, a, on the Kepler mission, she'll begin um, the web chat beginning at that time. And throughout the evening, um, we'll have various other scientists, uh, Dr. Melissa McGrath here from Marshall, John, Dr. Jonathan Certain also here from Marshall, Dr. Renee Weber from Marshall, and Mitzi Adams from Marshall will be chiming in throughout the evening. Um, it's a great opportunity to go in. If you've got a question, just uh, send it in. Uh, they'll answer it or point you in the right direction if they don't know the answer. Um, it's a great way to kind of get involved in the activity. Now, it was really interesting. Uh, Jim Green found this, uh, this quote uh, from the last, uh, from the last uh, set of uh, transits that occurred in 1882 by uh, William Harkness at the U.S. Naval Observatory. He says, there will be another transit of Venus. There will be no other transit of Venus till the 21st century of our era has dawned upon the Earth. And June flowers are blooming in 2004. Well, this is 2012. June flowers are blooming. And the interesting uh, statement is, what will the state be, what will the state of science, what will be the state of science when the next transit season arrives? God only knows. And as I read that, I was thinking, well, gee, I wonder what's, what the state of science is going to be uh, in 2117 uh, when the next one uh, comes. We don't know, but God does. All right. And that's the presentation. Any questions? Y'all ready to go see the transit? All right, okay. Yes, here's a question. Um, the question is that uh, on the first prediction, they, they uh, predicted it, but they couldn't see it from Europe. And the reason is um, uh, not the, the entire globe, the, the Venus transit only lasts for a certain period of time. And, uh, and so not the entire globe doesn't see it at all times. And so whenever that was in 1882 or something like that, um, Europe happened to be in this no visible zone um, because um, you know, if, it, if it took like 24 hours to go across the sun, which is the time it takes for the earth to rotate, then everybody could see it, but it's less than that. And so some parts of the earth just don't, just don't get to see it. Yes? I think it's going to be that picture. Now, I, yeah, I think it begins at the uh, top of that. Um, um, oops. I think, it's, I, I think that this is, this is an accurate depiction, that when you look at the solar disk through your glasses, um, it will begin up here, and it will go across this way. Now, uh, th that's, I'm just going to trust the posters right. So. But you can, but you will, you, you don't need a, you don't need your binoculars, you don't need a telescope, you know, you'll, you'll see a little dot going across. Of course, it's a lot better if you do have it projected in some way. Any other questions? All right, well, I want to thank you. Um, uh, uh, share your, your, your knowledge or things you've learned today with your cohorts uh, um, at work as well. And um, if there are some glasses left over, um, now I'm going to wing it. I'm not sure how we're going to get it to everybody, but I'm going to give it, um, uh, ask Janet Anderson to be um, kind of the point of contact. And so if, if, if you get back to your office and you want people to, uh, um, and someone expresses an interest, say, oh, gee, I wish I had some one of those glasses, then uh, we're going to uh, then contact Janet Anderson and somehow we'll get those to you um, if, they're, if, they're, if there's any left over there. Thank you very much. Um, hope you enjoyed your lunch.